Ruth and daughter Jacqueline are up here. And uh, Pastor did ask me to fill in for him while he's away relaxing with his wife um, down in the Cape. And so uh, we wish him very well on a nice relaxing trip. And uh, I do count it as a real privilege to, uh, to be up here. Um, this is really always a unique opportunity for me, and I really, really thank um, him, and I thank you um, for being here. And I hope what I have to share today uh, is something that will be of value to you. So I want to get right into the uh, message that I have for you today. Um, are you a dot? Um, I mean, what are all, of, you know, quickly, what are all the characteristics of a dot? Uh, the one that comes to mind to me is that it's small. And, uh, you know, if you happen to feel like a dot, then you're in the right place this morning. Um, so, um, in the 1987 uh, romantic comedy film, The Princess Bride, there's a character by the name of Vizzini. And he's always going around and he's using the word inconceivable. The only trouble is, is that every time he uses the word inconceivable, the inconceivable thing seems to always happen. Uh, this goes on for a while until one of his traveling companions, Inigo Montoya, has had enough. And he blurts out, you keep using that word. I do not think it means what you think it means. Uh, thereby providing the film with one of its more quotable lines. Uh, this example illustrates a kind of confusion and even frustration that can occur when a word is misapplied um, or has multiple meanings that are used incorrectly. In this case, Vizzini was using the word inconceivable as a kind of trite statement of denial, similar to it can't be, inconceivable, while Inigo Montoya has been thinking it meant something more serious. This was a conflict of definition that finally led to the blow-up. Now, there's a word that is sometimes used in Christian circles that I'd like to focus our discussion on today, whose meaning can also sometimes be misunderstood and misused due to multiple meanings. I wouldn't say that it's greatly misused, and I'm sure all of you here use it pretty much correctly, but as an individual who grew up in the church and who has experienced firsthand definitional shifts and doctrinal variants in words, I would say that it's a word that deserves some attention, and that word is insignificance. Now, if you think of your experience with this word, or, or you go online and you see how Christians use it, you'll tend to find two different kinds of statements. One is that Christ, in Christianity, no one is insignificant. God didn't make junk. We are God's workmanship. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. So in conclusion, we are all definitely positively significant. How many would agree with that? Okay, we are significant. However, the other sort of statement is that God uses insignificant people. So if you look at folks like David, you know, he was just a shepherd. And, you know, when Samuel came around to pick a king, he wasn't there because nobody really gave him second thought. You know, that was just David. Um, and yet he went on to become one of Israel's most important kings. Um, or you take somebody like Peter, who when he was chosen as a disciple of Christ, he was just a fisherman. And yet he went on to become one of the most significant apostles of Christ. So how many of you would agree, though, that God uses insignificant people? Okay, so that's also true. And since we can agree with both statements, it's fairly obvious there must be two different but valid senses of the word. But it should also be obvious that there's also an apparent contradiction here, too. I mean, how can God use insignificant people if no one is insignificant? Um, this makes it imperative for one to be contextually clear when they use the word insignificant, so as not to munge the meaning. But is it possible that there might be a better way of defining these concepts to remove the ambiguity? Well, as it turns out, the scriptures generally used to provide our definitions of significance and insignificance don't actually tend to use the words significant or insignificant. Instead, they're generally framed around statements and stories about value. And there's really two different kinds of value that I want to specify here. For example, when Christians correctly use the phrase, no one is insignificant, the scriptures usually used to back this up are the ones that speak about our intrinsic or built-in value as human beings. 
These scriptures bolster the notion that all humans have value and that we are God's creation, loved by him, and have the potential to do whatever he has empowered us to do. It is from these kinds of scriptures that we get the concept of all men are created equal and the root of why we are required to love one another, Christian or non-Christian, care about one another, and encourage one another, saved or unsaved. On the other hand, when Christians correctly say that God uses insignificant people, the scriptures usually used to back this up are typically speaking to examples of people who started out lowly and obscure and then rose to importance in God's kingdom. That is, those who possessed the intrinsic value that we just spoke about, but had little or no realized or consequential value to start, but were willing and later had impact. Now, both of these types of value, or significance if we want to call it that, are critical to understand. However, due to the constraints of time um, this morning, I've decided to focus on intrinsic value for the rest of this message. Part of the reason is that I don't really hear it talked about a whole lot. And the second reason is because in many respects, intrinsic value is, um, is not always well ascertained and consequently not always well felt. And so I thought it'd be good to explore the reasons why. But before I can elucidate on those reasons, it's mandatory that we first make it absolutely clear what intrinsic value is. So what is this intrinsic value that I'm talking about here? Well, intrinsic value is all about the collection of God-given attributes that we, meaning all people, um, are privileged to use, where the word privilege means both honored and authorized to use. So what are these attributes? And we have them up here. Um, well, the first three here, mind, will, and emotion, are the classic attributes of the soul, which we receive at creation, and which we believe all, uh, humans are the only ones to truly possess. They define who we are as individuals, and importantly, they're eternal. On the other hand, life opportunities and responsibilities relate to the things that we receive from God and that we operate on and make choices about. That is, these are the things that we apply our mind, will, and emotions to. These are the things that God gives, and in a sense, we take. What do I mean by that? Well, God gives us life, and we take care of it. God gives us opportunities, and we take the opportunities. God gives us responsibilities, and we take the responsibilities. And finally, we have the attributes of time, situation, and place, which represent the primary constraints and extents that God has divinely placed on our ability to act. They define what we can and can't do, and they also explain why we can't do everything, and frequently help to steer us as well. For example, time provides us with seasons where certain things are possible, and then those seasons end opening up a new season. Similarly, situation also manages the extents and limits. For example, uh, where you live, whether you're married, what degrees you have. Things like this all determine to some extent what you can and can't do. And to the degree that God is in control of this, our lives have a sense of order and not chaos. Finally, there's something I call place. But here, I'm not thinking about a physical location, but more about purpose. In other words, your place in this world. This may seem difficult uh, to get a grip on, almost mystical, but perhaps the reason that it's elusive is because although it's an intrinsic gifted attribute that we all have, it's actually probably the least individualistic. Adam was given such a place, and so are we. We all share it. And that place or purpose or role, if you want to put it that way, is that of a steward. Stewards of God's creation and of his will. Now, taken together, these intrinsic attributes or investments that God puts into us, especially our roles, make humans incredibly unique and special. But why do many Christians, and indeed humans, not always feel this incredible significance? One reason is failure to recognize the fullness of what we are as created beings, but the remedy for that is simple. Don't do that. 
The other, though, is more entrenched and thornier, which is succumbing to naturalistic thought. Now, why would Christians succumb to such a thing, you may ask? Well, mainly because the philosophy of naturalism often overlaps Christian values in ways that make its deviation hard to detect and thus easy to appropriate or syncretize into our faith. As a Christian also trained in the sciences, I see the symptoms of this all too frequently, and it often bugs me, um, especially with, ex with respect to something that I call the dot complex. So what do, I, what do I mean by the dot complex? Well, the dot complex is a point of view rooted in a natural perspective failure that can be easily exploited. Simply stated, it's a strong tendency or bias humans have to feel small in front of big things more than they feel big in front of small things. For example, when visiting Manhattan, I feel viscerally small next to these really tall skyscrapers. As I should, I mean, I am small compared to those skyscrapers. However, I don't feel big next to the ant that runs across in front of me on the sidewalk. Now, why is that when I am roughly 500 times taller than the ant and only about 200 times smaller than the building. Similarly, when I visited the Grand Tetons at Canadian Rockies several years ago, the huge mountains felt consistem consistently awesome in size, as they should. I mean, that's why we went. But for some reason, I never feel huge next to the grains of sand on a beach, when technically I should, since I'm mountain-sized compared to them. This perspective imbalance, especially when exploited, can make our intrinsic value, that is, all these things that God gave us to make us intrinsically valuable, vulnerable to instant trivialization or reduction to a dot. Um, by simple but deceptive big sky arguments. For example, the sky is big compared to a jet. Would you agree with that? I took some flying lessons, and you know, one of the things that they taught us is how to be situationally aware. And it's amazing how tiny little planes are out there. But the sky is, a big, is big compared to a jet. But if a huge jet is flying over me at an altitude of five miles, it looks like a tiny dot, and it tempts me to say, my, in the big scheme of things, jumbo jets are really tiny. However, does the fact that it looks tiny from here change its intrinsic size or its value as a transportation vehicle? No, of course not. But it's amazing how susceptible we are to thinking that, well, that our value is modified by and must submit to similar arguments. So where in real life do we encounter this sort of thing? Well, it's pretty pervasive, but especially in schools, academia, nature programming, um, and in pop morality, where naturalism and naturalistic thought predominate. So let me give you a classic example of this. On February 14, 1990, the Voyager 1 spacecraft took this picture, which became rather famous. It's popularly called the pale blue dot, it was a picture of the Earth taken from a distance of about 3.7 billion miles, roughly the distance to the space between Neptune and Pluto. The picture was requested by Carl Sagan, a well-known uh, science popularizer and planetary scientist who died in 1996. As an astronomy enthusiast myself, I absolutely love this picture. I really, really do. I just don't love what was done with it. Carl Sagan, who was a naturalist having no belief in God, wrote a book based on this picture. And to the degree that he spoke scientifically, I always respected and enjoyed his exposition. He really was a good scientist. Um, however, when he came to wax philosophical, especially about this picture, there's one thing that he wrote that never really sat well with me. And I quote, our posturings, our imagined self-importance, the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe are challenged by this point of light, this uh, point of pale light. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In our obscurity, in all this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. Now, this always struck me as incredibly isolating and frankly depressing. Um, however, it's also one of the best examples of the dot complex 
and the big sky argument being put to use. The key thought here is in the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe. Now note that Sagan's concern here is not about rampant geocentrism, okay? He's not worried about people going around thinking that the Earth is in the center of the universe. Um, but rather, what he's clearly doing here is making a thinly disguised insinuation against any of those who might dare to believe or try to teach that mankind is special or holds a privileged place of any kind. This is, he insists, because compared with the vastness of space, we are so small. And so any notion that humans hold any kind of privileged position in this universe is automatically hubris by definition. But is this really true? Is this even scientifically responsible to say? No, this in fact is Sagan speaking wholly as a naturalist philosopher and not as a scientist. Because while I totally agree that science has shown that we're not in the geographic center of the universe, I am unaware of any proof for the dismissal of all privileged positions or even how science could possibly do that. For example, consider the mind. Okay, That's one of the uh, intrinsic attributes we just mentioned before. It's really hard, I mean, go out of your way hard, not to see humans as holding a privileged position. I mean, have you read um, a good science book by a gorilla lately? Or had surgery by a crow? Um, which are supposed to be two of the most intelligent non-human species out there. Probably not. Now, Sy Sagan, an advocate of SETI, which is a search for extraterrestrial intelligence, might have argued that even so, it is hubris to think that we are the most intelligent species in the universe. But without convincing entry, uh, evidence to the contrary, until such a superior race is found, we remain undeniably in the privileged position when it comes to the mind, and that is no delusion. But in addition to the mind, there's another critically important privileged position to consider, too. And even Sagan almost conflictingly promotes it when he says elsewhere about this picture that the picture underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. So where did that come from? Well, it comes from even Sagan's need to look at the picture the other way, the unavoidably right way not the gloomy way that proclaims that it makes us feel isolated and alone and insignificant, but rather the one that seems to best express the sentiment that the Apollo astronauts had when they visited the moon and they looked back at the Earth, which is that it evokes a feeling not of isolation, but of vulnerability. And it makes you feel not insignificant, but as one who has been given a sublime and privileged position of responsibility by their creator for engaging in the care of this place and its inhabitants, the responsibility of a steward. But here we come to the crux of the matter, which stubbornly remains. Yes, we have singular minds, we agree with that, and great responsibility. But how do we combat feeling small? After all, regardless of all my flighty words here, Sagan is still fundamentally right in saying that we are vanishingly small compared to the universe, right? Well, maybe not as small as you think, though, or small in the way that you think. Let's take a look at these pictures up here. Um, what do a cell and the moon have in common? Um, the picture on the left is a short video. It is a video, right? Is it moving? OK, good. Okay, You can see the little guy running around there? OK, good. Um, this is a video clip of an amoeba, which is a one-celled animal, uh, that actually Jacqueline grew uh, from a culture for a science fair project a few years ago. Uh, the picture on the right is a daytime photo of the moon that I took from my backyard. So what do these have in common? Well, the diameter of the moon is about 2,200 miles, making it about 2 million times bigger than me. Rounded to orders of magnitude, that's about six orders of magnitude, or six factors of 10 larger. Compared to little old me, okay, it sure makes me feel small. However, biological cells like the amoeba on the left are roughly a million times smaller than me. So technically, I should feel big next to one, since to a cell, I'm the size of the moon. So if I assess this property, how big am I really? Well, in this case, I'm neither big or small. I'm right in the middle. And that's not just a frame of mind. 
Now let's zoom out and use these pictures to try and apply the big sky argument. In the picture on the left here, we see a photo of the Earth taken from the surface of Mars. In the Martian sky, Earth is, a, is merely a bright star and quite tiny. You probably can't even see it from where you're sitting. From Saturn, it's also a dot and absolutely dwarfed by the ringed planet. You can see the ringed planet, Saturn there in the foreground. And if we travel to the edge of planetary space and take a picture like Voyager did of the pale blue dot, it is a dot so small that its apparent size is less than a pixel. This perspective on our planet is due to the size of our solar system being about a trillion times larger than us, or about 12 orders of magnitude, factors of 10 larger. That makes me feel puny indeed. However, this is an unbalanced comparison unless in the same breath we happen to mention that we are at the same time about a trillion times larger than an atom and that the estimated number of atoms in each one of our bodies exceeds the number of estimated stars in the entire universe by several orders of magnitude. That's a lot of tiny atoms to carry around. A whole sub-universe, in fact. In other words, compared to the solar system, we're small, that's true, but compared to the solar system and atoms, we're again roughly in the middle. Finally, let's move out to galactic distances in the range of 20-ish um, or so, a bit more, maybe perhaps um, orders of magnitude larger than us. Here are a couple pictures I took from my driveway. Um, the photo on the left is a gas and dust cloud called the Trifid Nebula. It's in our galaxy and about 4,000 light years away, where one light year is approximately 6 trillion miles. The photo on the right is of what scientists call a grand design spiral galaxy. This one is named the Whirlpool Galaxy and is in our galactic local neighborhood um, and is about 31 million uh, light years away. These objects are beautiful. Their size is immense. Their distance is massive, which is why they fascinate me personally so much and why I observe and take pictures of them and like to show them to others as illustrations of what God can do. One can't help but feel awe and a sense of smallness when considering them, and that is all healthy. However, just as in the previous examples, it turns out that all around us and within us are subatomic particles made by that same God that are just as much smaller than us than these objects are distant. In other words, to a particle like a neutrino, I am at least galaxy-sized. And so in a universe filled with neutrinos and galaxies, it's not a mistake to regard one's own size as being somewhere in the middle. Now, this is a really cool diagram. Um, and this is where I want to start to draw some conclusions. The key to appreciating all of this is to begin to see human scale as an intentional design decision by God. And when combined with all of our other intrinsic attributes, to see even our physical size, which we tend to think about as ignorable, as very special and purposed. The diagram in the slide here helps us summarize why. On the left, and descending from the top, we have progressively larger things, like the moon, the solar system, and then galaxies. On the right, we see progressively smaller things shown in a symmetric arrangement by order of magnitude. When we do this, human scale, it would seem, is right in the middle. This is remarkably intriguing, if it's true, but could there be faults here? For example, science can't tell us if the universe is infinitely large, nor whether the sm scale of, the s of smallness continues infinitely. I believe, personally, that they probably both do. And so if both ends of this arced line proceed to infinity, in other words, this line here of smallness just keeps going past here and goes to infinity, and over here the line keeps going and proceeds to infinity, and I'm sorry, AJ, I know I said I wasn't going to move, but I did, um, then any mathematician is going to be able to tell you that there is no middle of an infinite line. All right, and so, um, you know, this particular... Um, conclusion would be a false conclusion um, if they go to infinity. This could also be an illusion. 
Uh, for example, if a sailor at sea computes the distance to the horizon looking first to the west and then to the east and proclaims in awe, wow, I'm right in the middle, we wouldn't be very impressed. The earth is a globe and so the horizon out at sea is always pretty much the same distance away in any direction you look. However, if the sailor at sea were to see a shoreline to the west and a shoreline to the east and compute them as equidistant, then that would suddenly become meaningful. In fact, the middle position may be an incredibly valuable vantage point. If you needed, for example, to keep an eye on gun emplacements on both shores and also be farthest from them. Or if you knew the water became shallow and rocky near the shores, making a central location the safest. In other words, regardless of how far back the land beyond the shore goes, being equidistant from the shorelines is, genu is a genuinely special place, both strategically and tactically. So if the arc on our diagram does continue down infinitely in both directions, are there shorelines that might make a middle real? Well, it looks like there may very well be. Due to the expansion of the universe, it turns out that similar to a person swimming upstream in a current that exceeds their swim speed, photons of light from beyond a certain distance, um, between 13 and 14 billion light years to be somewhat exact, um, will never ever reach us. Consequently, it's a practical limit on how far we can see, and even if one builds a telescope the size of the entire galaxy, uh, you just can't see farther than this. Yeah, you can see more detail, which is what large telescopes are intended to do, but you really can't see much farther. There also seems to be a hard limit on the other side, too. It's called the Planck length. Physics has no constraints on how small something can be. However, anything smaller than this mathematically computed length would, according to known physics, basically collapse into a tiny black hole upon any, ti uh, upon any attempt to actually try to detect it. Um, think, of, think about being in a dark room with bubbles, you know, soap bubbles floating around and trying to determine their size by, with your finger, okay? That's sort of the gist of the thing. Um, the little black holes wouldn't suck up the laboratory, by the way, um, I think. Um, but it's a hard limit on how small we could possibly detect things to be. So if we regard these as practical shorelines that are built into our universe by its creator, then we come to realize that for all practical purposes, perhaps we really are centrally located with regard to our scale, with no other position providing a better vantage point over the whole of creation, the best place to appreciate it, and the best place to be a steward of it. So, are you a dot? The logical flaw with dot thinking is buried in a kind of circular reason reasoning known as begging the question. And it's a purely naturalistic and not scientific argument. It basically posits that humans are, insignif are insignificant because we are small. And it relies on the hearer just accepting the built-in premise that smallness equals insignificance. However, it never considers the possibility that our size might actually be intentional and ideal. For example, would you ever say that microchips are insignificant because they're small? No, I mean, their small size is actually their virtue. But if smallness were somehow to make us insignificant, what preferred size would make us significant? If everyone suddenly become, became 30 feet tall, would that make us more profound, or would it just compound our problems? Even if you were the size of the Earth, you'd still be a speck at Voyager's distance. And if you were galaxy-sized, you'd still be a speck from the other side of the universe and still unable to see farther than the shoreline. Maybe universe-sized? Well, then you'd have no friends because you're the only one who could fit. Note that these big sky arguments, uh, these big sky misrepresentations about smallness also relate tightly to humility as well. Humility is not measured by how small, insignificant, or powerless you see yourself. That's a naturalistic definition. Rather, humility is measured solely by the one you submit to. Recall that Christ was both the most significant person to ever live and simultaneously the most humble. Would Christ have been more significant if he had been a different physical size, or was his size perfect and his significance and humility real all, really all boiled down to his, his ability to fully ascertain 
and to wield all that he was given in his human nature to the purpose of his heavenly father. Humility to a naturalist is to regard oneself as only natural, a speck in the universe, and delusional to think that you have a higher purpose or that there's anyone out there to save you. Humility to a Christian, however, is to first experience salvation, and then to know that you, like Christ, are heavenly equipped, the perfect size, and then to submit to his higher purpose. To conflate these two definitions of humility or significance in any way would be a fallacy. So don't make that mistake. So in summary, intrinsic value is not about physical size, but it's all about knowing and appreciating the God-given attributes that give us a privileged vantage point and assigned capability. Think for a moment about the largest physical object that you can. Let's say it's a galaxy. Does a galaxy have a mind? Does a galaxy control its will? Does a galaxy have consciousness or intelligence or take on responsibility? Is a galaxy able to appreciate the complexity of a cell? Can a galaxy understand the nature of its own composition and write a book about it? Does a galaxy feel the passage of time? Is a galaxy alive? Is it given a soul? Now, galaxies are overwhelmingly large and can be beautiful and awe-inspiring and even demonstrate advanced physics, but never to another galaxy, only to humans on the dot, because they are the only ones that have been granted the ability to understand both the natural and, that, and what God has revealed of the supernatural. That's what makes us intrinsically valuable. Among God's mortal creation, only humans can appreciate. Only humans can be without excuse, the most privileged position possible, the most responsible, and the most entrusted. Romans 1.20 says this, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. Consider that this statement of Paul's was not made to Christians specifically, but to all of mankind. All of us share this same vantage point, and not even a naturalist evolutionist holds an excuse, since the end products, regardless of the process, were designed to be both beautiful and hold obvious imprints of our creator. So if some see it and some don't, it's by choice. And so with that, we come to the end of our discussion about intrinsic value this morning. However, there does remain a vital need to keep in mind that all this intrinsic value must be ultimately turned into realized value in order for it to become consequential. That kind of val value is all about how one uses their God-given attributes and privileged positions as his workmanship to be consequential here on earth and in God's kingdom. If I ever have another opportunity to speak here, um, that will almost certainly be my next topic, because it's kind of a part two. Um, so to wrap this up, um, always keep in mind these three, what I call these three laws of comparison. Compared to God, he is incomparable. You are of great value to God, but he's always the king. Compared to your neighbors, on the other hand, you are their peer and responsibility is bidirectional. Here, intrinsic value is balanced. But finally, and this has been the thrust of this particular message, other than your fellow humans, compared to any other article of nature, your vantage point and God-given resources place you in a unique, privileged position, a steward having extraordinary capability and mission and resources. You are not a speck on a dot, but you are made at the perfect scale to appreciate and utilize all of God's creation in ways that would make him proud. The perfect scale to be without excuse. So thank you. And God bless.